Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, the panel discussion is about uh, empowering women in analytics and data science and why that's the smart thing to do. Um, I'm going to start off with, uh, you know, uh, uh, some facts about gender diversity. Um, gender diverse companies uh, are 15 percent more likely to end up with uh, higher revenue than non-diverse companies. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this, uh, this is something that's been established repeatedly. However, um, only 4% of uh, Fortune 500 CEOs are women. And in fact, uh, it is more likely to have a Fortune, CEO, uh, Fortune 500 CEO named David than being a woman. So clearly, there is a big problem. Um, there is a long way to go in terms of achieving diversity needs. Um, I think the good news is that uh, many companies recognize that diversity of all kinds is essential, uh, and many companies want to solve for it. Um, in this panel discussion, uh, what I'm trying to focus on is uh, specifically for uh, data science. How do we ensure that more women participate in data science? Um, I have a great panel here. Uh, very happy to have them. I have some very distinguished uh, senior leaders in analytics, uh, both women and uh, hopefully also the male perspective. Um, so I thought I'll start off by uh, uh, doing a quick round of introductions. If uh, you guys could just introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Iqbal Kaur. I have uh, more than 20 years of experience uh, in analytics and focused mostly on consumer analytics. And currently, I'm co-founder at a company called Zalotech, which is in the area of marketing analytics. Hi, I'm Susan, uh, and I have over 15 years of experience, uh, mostly in marketing analytics, but also have worked in manufacturing. Uh, and currently, I'm working as uh, a delivery lead at uh, Analytic Edge, which is a marketing analytics startup. I'm happy to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Shankar. Uh, I was uh, presenting earlier today uh, from a company called ZS. Uh, we do a lot of work. Incidentally, we were just discussing before the fact that all of us are in the marketing and marketing analytics space. So at ZS, we do a lot of the marketing analytics across life science, um, companies across different verticals. I have close to about 18 years of experience all with ZS. Um, prior to that, I did my uh, PhD from a university called Purdue. And then I was, in fact, I did my undergrad from IIT. Uh, I was just imagining that uh, when I was an undergrad, I was in chemical engineering, and there were 34 boys and two girls. So I'm just feeling I'm in the reverse position a little bit in the span, right? So uh, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it back then, but. Uh, <laughs> Great, glad to have you here. Um, I thought we could start off by uh, just sort of uh, establishing the current state of diversity um, in data science, uh, maybe in India and outside of India. Um, of course, I know uh, quite a few, uh, you know, really uh, stellar women leaders. Um, but, you know, what's your perspective on, uh, you know, what's the current state? And I thought I'd ask each question to each of you and maybe just get some perspectives. Yeah. Um, I was reading some statistics, and they are not very encouraging. So, in fact, there is a recent study earlier this year, I think February or something, that uh, talks about the percentage of women team members in artificial intelligence and machine learning in companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon. And these are the companies, you know, companies like Google is where we say, you know, they provide everything to the employees, flexibility, and, you know, you name it, it's there. And even there, the percentage of women in these roles is less than 20%. So the company score, it's around 30%, but when the figures are actually looked at, it is around 15%. So yeah, uh, statistics are not very encouraging even today, in spite of uh, we're talking about diversity challenges from the time there was a, on the time issue, there was the board of GE and there was not a single woman in there. I think it was almost three decades back. Mm, yeah. And yeah, things haven't changed a whole lot. Okay, so I have a slightly different uh, uh, view. I wouldn't say a view, but I, I, my previous job was in manufacturing. I was in an old school manufacturing company. And I went once to the shop floor and I saw that there was no, not even a single woman. So I think compared to some of those kind of fields, I think um, analytics is not bad. Definitely scope to improve, but uh, I think, uh, you know, we do have women. It's just that we need to see that improve. Yeah. So, um, again, speaking more a little bit from our experience in an organization like ZS, I would say, uh, 
I'll take more of the view across levels, right? So as you, uh, or folks who join in the organization versus uh, folks who stay and progress, at least I see that, uh, I know STEM itself is underrepresented in terms of women, but at least the, uh, at the junior levels, I believe the uh, representation is similar to what is there in the STEM. Uh, but as you progress in uh, your career, as you look at the more senior levels of the organization, there does the disparity does get uh, uh, wider. So that's the, uh, yeah. and that is probably true in all forms of services, product-based firms, analytics, and technology. So, so um, that's, I have a follow-up question. Uh, in general, uh, we've worked across a wide variety of industries and sectors. Do we feel that maybe there are some areas that are better represented than others? Um, I think manufacturing is an example where uh, Susan said. So I have worked primarily in financial services and retail um, and mostly in analytics space. So my, you know, data is a little bit skewed that way. But I did find in retail there are a lot more women. At, when I'm talking about retail, not just analytics, I mean, when I deal with the, when I'm in, in this role, I have to do a lot of selling. So my clients are retail clients and CPG clients. And I found when it comes to retail companies, we have a lot of senior talent in the retail companies. And it's probably because retail companies realize that a lot of buying is done by women. And so hence, a lot of decision makers back in the HQ also have to be women. So yeah, I have seen more uh, women uh, in terms of the percentage at senior levels, uh, definitely in retail. Um, and I think the other perspective is also uh, possibly around roles, because data science, clearly, there are multiple roles. Um, you know, there's certainly more uh, maybe engineering focused roles where uh, my sense is that the representation is probably even more uh, or even less than uh, maybe more front facing roles. Yeah, so uh, I would say that, uh, you know, there's always, it's always good to have diversity in, in approaches and in skills and in, in any form diversity is good and is beneficial. So. Uh, therefore, I think gender diversity is also beneficial. Coming to your point about the roles, it's generally perceived that women tend to be good, you know, very meticulous, very detail-oriented, uh, and therefore are more suited to delivery roles, whereas the men are more suited to architect roles. I, I don't know if I believe that that is the case, but right now it would be great if we can see uh, some women taking up those architect positions, because I don't think it's that women don't aspire to that. It's just that, you know, they're not there right now. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll offer a little bit of the consulting and professional services perspective, right? Like these jobs, typically the expectations that you're uh, kind of really putting clients first, right? Whatever they ask for, you're <laughs> ready to serve. And so the expectation of uh, the timings that you're spending at work with your teams, with your clients is significantly larger than what uh, I would see in uh, other jobs. And so, in fact, it's kind of uh, startlingly different. So when I go to my client organizations, we work a lot with sales and marketing professionals. There, uh, the mix of uh, men and women is probably more representative of what <laughs> uh, we see more broadly. But when I look at our own organization or uh, professional service organization, consulting services, the uh, representation gets even more starker potentially because of the uh, nature of the work and the demands that it's placing and it doesn't quite, uh, as yet, it's not tailored to yeah. uh, meeting the broader diversity. Yeah. Um, which brings me to uh, my next question, which is around why would you consider data science to be, um, uh, you know, why would you consider data science, uh, would it benefit from having more women? Uh, and maybe I could start with you in reverse order, but uh, you know, what makes it, uh, you know, important um, or useful for data science to have more women participate? I think uh, Iqbal touched upon it, right? So I think that uh, concept of, so if I think about data science and we are servicing, uh, building analytics in order to, in the marketing context, if you're trying to appeal to customers, right? Your customer base is not skewed. It's uh, <laughs> uh, very much uh, uh, mixed, right? So in that sense, uh, in order for you to build algorithms, methods uh, that really keep the customer in mind and uh, generate that, you not only need to have a high level understanding, but you need to have the experiences in your team that can build products, algorithms that can really be uh, tailored towards uh, those customers. And so it's important that data science has, of course, gender is one dimension, it's the dominant dimension, but it needs to have the right uh, mix of diversity across ethnicity, uh, 
gender, age groups, right? You want, of course, data science is a hot field amongst the young folks, but you do need the perspectives of some of the gray hat folks that also. So I think you need that reflection of the uh, customers that you're serving in your uh, teams as well. Okay, uh, I just feel that, you know, sometimes in these gender discussions, we have this thing, this notion that, you know, we need to just get that 50% quota of women in the organization. And I just feel that that does a disservice to many incredibly talented women. And uh, I think we need to have women because I think there are some very good women out there. You know, it's just that simple. And I think, uh, Maybe sometimes they're a little hard to find, but I do believe they exist, and I believe that increasingly uh, we should be able to find those women. So, so yeah. So my argument is simply that there are some really smart women out there. Okay. I think I'll just build upon um, the argument that we need to have the representation in the room when something is being built for everyone in the world, right? Um, uh, there was a f earlier this year there was a research done by MIT and Microsoft together and they found that the facial recognition algorithms of IBM and Microsoft they are not perfect uh, they were near perfect when the photos of uh, male uh, with lighter skin were shown to them but they erred a lot when the photos comprised of women with dark skin so what is, what is going on here, right? We, we keep thinking it's artificial intelligence, it's machine, and machine cannot be biased. But remember, we build these algorithms. We trained them. We provided the weights to the parameters. We chose confidence over support or support over confidence, which, wherever we gave more weight. And we brought all the cognitive biases that were earlier there in the model building, you know, by not including certain variables, forgetting them. Okay, so today we don't forget variables. We throw all the data that is in there because, the, you know, machines can do it. But while building the algorithm, while training them, we are introducing those cognitive biases. And if we are going to have only, you know, male with lighter skin building those models, no wonder those facial recognition softwares are doing a great job of identifying those photos and not of the women with darker skin. So yes, both in terms of women and ethnicity, we need to have those developers in the room when they're developing because somebody made this statement and I really loved it. You cannot develop an app for everybody in the world if there is not representation of everybody in the world when it's being developed. Absolutely, and I think you make a very compelling point because uh, you know with AI and machine learning now the impacts are also at massive scale, and so if you're not participating in the building um, of or, you know of the algorithms of the apps, then uh, you really run the risk of building something that's absolutely out of uh, whack, and uh, maybe it will be too late to come back and fix it. Um, great. So let me flip the question. Um, we talked a little bit about um, you know uh, why uh, data science would benefit from having more women in it. Um, but the question that I now want to pose is, uh, why should women consider data science? You know, uh, why is data science uh, an attractive option for women? And of course, uh, I've had a great career in data science. It's been very rewarding and enriching, and all of us here have. But, uh, you know, specifically, why is this a good option for women to consider? Clearly not enough women are thinking about data science seriously. What would make it interesting? I think for me, the, the sole reason would be that this is a developing industry still. A lot of new stuff is happening, right? I mean, um, if, if you talk about manufacturing and, you know, the, the new technologies are still being driven by, now, is now being driven by what is happening in data sciences. You collect the data, you figure out what is to be done. Artificial intelligence is already half driving our planes and doing a whole lot of stuff. So whatever new and exciting is going to happen is going to happen in this space. And as a woman, I would want other women to be part of this exciting journey. You know, we should not be on the sidelines. We should be contributing to something that's happening all around us. There is a, the world is becoming smarter. Maybe we are becoming less smarter because we're relying on machines. But in general, the world is becoming smarter and we should be part of this journey. Okay, um, I think when I think back, uh, when I was in university, I went to a good university, and I think I was virtually the only one who joined analytics as a field, because back then it was like really in a nascent stage, and we had only one or two companies here in Bangalore working in the area. So, uh, but I think things have changed. It's really hot, everyone's heard of it. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of publicity, I think 
the industry is very well poised to get wonderful talent. But for the women, I think, uh, unlike some of the other professions, I think it's uh, it's it's very rewarding. It's uh, I think it it uses some of the skills that women traditionally are you know most women have, and also you know I mean we have to uh, think about you know what balance in life. And I think it's very amenable to having, uh, being able to manage it with a, a family and other, you know, very practical constraints. So I think it's a great choice uh, for women for many of those reasons. Cool. So uh, of course we go to campuses and uh, so on, and we do see that uh, when we offer a data science role was some of the other operations roles, there's a lot more excitement from the. Uh, women uh, in campus as well. So I do feel like there is some degree of sense of excitement or something new. Uh, I think there are two uh, things I'd like to just add. I guess one is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the kind of uh, things that you need to be a good data scientist, right? So it's innovation, a new field, lot of uncertainty, excitement. So the ability to be creative, right, is very critical. Uh, you need to have the ability to, like, there are many different problems you can solve, so how do you effectively prioritize and uh, solve those problems? And you're not only experimenting, but how do you scale it and uh, bring it to fruition and create impact? I'm not saying that women are better or men are better, but I think these skills are probably available across yeah. the pool, and it's probably things that folks are uh, can bring from either gender. And I think the other piece, of course, I think what Susan was pointing to is it's a newer, uh, field and uh, in that sense I would say you're probably banging against your head to break the if you have to get into manufacturing it's probably going to be harder here data science as a community there's probably less bias <laughs> that is preset so it's probably a more of a level playing field so to speak so um, yeah I think some of the uh, some of the insights that I've had from other conversations have been specifically around, uh, you know, certainly sets of skills that women at least are perceived to be better at, um, you know, whether or not that stands up to scrutiny, but possibly that gives you a leg up um, in terms of, uh, you know, confidently launching yourself with that career, and it includes things like, uh, you know, detail orientation, but also collaboration and, uh, you know, getting teams to come together and sort of work towards a common goal. Uh, data science is very multidisciplinary. Uh, so, so what's your experience? Do you feel like those things matter? Um, or is it is it all just going to go out in the wash? So um, again, at the junior levels in our organization, again uh, we do see that men and women do shine equally, like in terms of promotion rates and uh, uh, kind of the kind of things here we hear from our clients. We do hear it about uh, ZSS in general, both women and men. So I'm not sure if women necessarily will do better, but uh, smart people will do better. Smart people will do better. <laughs> so, Okay, any other perspective on that or move on to the next question? Okay, um, let's, let's uh, sort of uh, uh, now talk about um, the key question, which is, you know, if data science is, is a great field and it's critical for women to get involved, how do we actually make sure that there, is, there are enough women with the right skills that are interested and excited about data science? And, uh, you know, this, 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 is, this is clearly not going to be an easy solution, um, but, you know, what's your thoughts on you know, how do we make this happen? At what level are interventions required? Um, I think the challenge is that, um, and for, I'll talk about first where the challenge is, and that's why where the intervention is needed. I think one of the challenges that uh, as, so analytics has changed. Analytics is no longer about extracting data and building model in SAS or R. It is, it is moving, it is becoming more about engineering, a lot of data engineering. And you know, the roles are not really very clear between a data engineer and data scientist anymore. And because of that, we need more engineers. And if we are talking about more women in AI and machine learning, we need more women engineers. And sadly, the statistics again are very poor here. I mean, if we look at last year, IITs had what, 11,000 students. And of that, the women were in, you know, hardly around 10%. In fact, there is a mandate that IITs have to increase it to 14%. If we take all the engineering schools in India, the women representation was 26%. Again, not great. And that reflects, if you look at women workforce in analytics, the ratio for women to men is one is to four. So it is same, you know, it is one is to three when it comes to in engineering colleges. So it is not surprising that it is very less 
when it comes to the workplace itself. So I guess whatever intervention we need to do has to be done at a level where women are seeking the right education in the first place so that they have the skill set and they can easily become part of uh, you know, analytics and artificial intelligence and ML driven work. So uh, there are a lot of, you know, lot of institutes, a lot of people who are coming together like girls who code and all and they are trying to encourage kids and teenagers to be more interested in science because Sarita was mentioning earlier that actually women taking computer science as specialization has dropped in the last 10 years and that's not that's not great for us right i mean as a woman i'm i'm worried about that okay why is it happening yeah. when number of people joining this industry is going up why are women not opting for education in this space so i guess i don't have the answer as to what exactly needs to be done but at some level we need more women first opting for the right education you know engineering for instance so that they are ready to join this workforce yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think that's probably the most important thing. I, I do believe that education uh, is is the key. And uh, I, I think, like, I think we all agreed that, uh, you know, filling a quota is uh, important, but we also want to do it in the right way. We want to have the right skills. We, we don't want anything to, you know, the quality of the product to suffer as a result of any kind of affirmative action. I think it, it has to be more uh, an opportunity enhancer rather than affirmative action because then I think we can uh, we can ensure that we're getting good quality in and also some of these things tend to be slightly long term you know I don't know if it can be fixed overnight but it's just that people need to get conscious people sh should want to fix the problem you know or op offer things like mentorship um, and then we were discussing uh, just before the uh, before this that uh, maybe you can source resumes. May maybe uh, we can impose uh, a kind of a quota on resumes. At least source some women resumes, and then maybe you will start to hire more women. So I think I agree. There should not be quota, but yes. uh, we were just jokingly talking about. But I think there is some merit to it. These IT exams were designed by men for men. Maybe it's time to revisit some of these reasons why women are not making the cutoff, right? Absolutely. One is, of course, are they applying enough? But when they're applying, when they're appearing for the exam, why are they not clearing it? Because we are all going through the same education. You know, we have the same exposure. But what is happening there? Yeah. So yeah. bias in the test itself. In, yeah, <laughs> possibly. Attack the root. <laughs> yeah. I, I know. The why questions were the no-brainer. <laughs> like, how is that much harder of course. Uh, question? So I think. Uh, Again, I don't claim to understand all of it and have an answer, but uh, some of the things I've observed uh, uh, as do in our organization is, because um, I think this notion of, it sounds a little cliched, but really celebrate the role models in the organization women, right? So don't take it for uh, granted. So just this year, uh, we've been in India only for about 13 years. We, so the number of partners in the organization is not very large. We just had our first partner who was a woman who got uh, elected. And so there's a big celebration around <laughs> that. And uh, likewise, uh, we are a global firm. So uh, getting the women leaders and tell their stories, right? Like both the challenges as well as uh, kind of how do they overcome them. I think that it, it should not feel insurmountable for the uh, folks who are joining the organization. It should feel possible. It might be a stretch, but at least you hear the stories and understand and consequently you help. Uh, people feel like it's doable, not uh, beyond their capabilities. And I think some of the, those are more the stories and kind of the rituals that you have in your organization that you need to continue to strengthen. But there is also the incentives that you didn't, uh, need to align as well. So uh, at ZS, we have a principal election process. And of course, there, we look at things like, are you innovative? Are you bringing expertise? Are you a thought leader? There are things like numbers that you measure on, like so are you being productive in terms of business development, kind of the work that you do. And so there is different parameters. And of course, when uh, people, and uh, it more often happens to be women who go through transitioning periods in their career, it impacts their ability to bring in uh, business or <laughs> uh, deliver a larger quantity of work and so on. So how do you make sure that you are being fair to the men in the organization, but also not penalizing uh, folks for <laughs> yeah. uh, going through this transition period. So paying attention to it and making sure that we are being 
uh, judicious in how we are evaluating folks, and uh, that's also important. So I think, I can, yeah. Uh, now that yeah. we have all in the answers, but some ideas. <laughs> no, actually, uh, you're touching upon my next question. But before I go there, um, I wanted to just pick up on uh, your theme about uh, the messaging, uh, because the other study that uh, you know I think we had discussed, uh, women in general tend to be underconfident. Um, you know, there was this study that said women with eight years of programming experience are as confident as men with one year of programming experience. And this is something that you see repeatedly uh -huh. across levels. Um, I attended a talk, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Bombay a, a couple of months ago uh, with uh, the CEO of IBM, Ginny Rometi, uh, when she was talking about uh, her experience where uh, she was interviewing for a job and, uh, you know, everyone loved it. She went home and she said, I don't know if I'm ready for it. And her husband said, a man would never say that. A man would say, I am ready for it, and then figure it out, right? But women tend to be a lot more cautious and, you know, perhaps realistic, maybe too realistic about, uh, you know, expectations. Um, so I think that idea of messaging is, is very critical and uh, possibly, you know, I, I want to maybe hear some thoughts on what can we do um, also in terms of interventions and sort of spreading that message to women because maybe they need to hear it more often. Do you think that is important? Do you think that's useful? So I think it is twofold. One is uh, the circumstance. So, you know, when we talk about our generation, the circumstances, the environment around us probably has made some of us that way. And we, we needed mentorship. I know I needed, I needed to hear it from somebody that the same thing, that when there's a job and there is a woman and a man and man will go and sell himself and woman, even though she's more qualified, she's not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we probably needed that mentorship. I'm hoping millennials don't need it that much, okay? I'm hoping that they are brought up in a different environment. But the second thing that I've observed, and this is what I've heard from a lot of women, even in our workspace analytics, that uh, when they do not get that vote of confidence from their male coworkers, and I can see that. So uh, in my team back, so we have a team in Cambridge and in Bangalore. Bangalore is mostly men, but Cambridge has a very good representation of women. And so there's, let me take example of a PhD in math who's a woman and a PhD in ML who's a guy. And we are discussing a model where the PhD in math has more expertise, but I sometimes find her taking, you know, like, you know, sometimes it will happen that uh, the confidence that should be displayed for in that area of expertise isn't there because maybe we are not providing the right inclusive environment or giving the signs that we believe that you know what you are saying. So a lot of times women engineers feel that the room doesn't acknowledge them as an engineer. They are acknowledged as women first and engineers later. So I guess, how do we sensitize uh, everybody, including some of us, maybe those biases have uh, you know, entered our you know, brainstream also, where even though we are women, sometimes maybe we end up thinking that, okay, a, a male engineer is probably better than a female one. So how do we are aware of these biases that are inside and are correcting them throughout and how do we sensitize our other team members, the newer team members as they enter the organization, that these biases exist, be aware of them, so that over time, the women in the workforce, whether it's analytics or not, start to re, you know, feel more confident because nobody else is undermining their confidence. So I think there's a, a role for, for the women themselves and there is a role for the organization. I think it would be great if organizations would get output focused it's very tangible and I think you you kind of know, at least in analytics, I think it's possible for us to measure some of those outputs and, and recognize the people who really deserve it and promote and compensate and do all of those things accordingly. But I think also coming back to Iqbal's point, I think she made a very interesting point that we need to have those role models, those mentors. And I don't think it's necessarily uh, you know, it's not necessary that we have female mentors. Like I've had some fantastic male mentors who I, I don't think look at me and say, oh, she's a woman. Uh, but you know, that, I, that I'm capable of doing something that I'm uh, able to contribute. So I think uh, having role models and mentors is an excellent way of sometimes working out where you need to step out of your comfort zone a little bit and, and you know, uh, go for those roles which suit you. Again, I, I, I really want to say that, you know, it's not necessary for all of us to be CEOs. Uh, it's, it's good for you to aspire to higher levels of leadership, but uh, 
you know, it's also important to feel happy and satisfied with what you do. Yeah. Yeah, and I was not aware of this stat that you mentioned, Sarita, so a bit of an eye-opener. Uh, so I'll put more of the male co-worker's perspective. So even if the intent is not there, I've probably had <laughs> unconscious biases and uh, so on. In fact, we went through a training just a few months back around unconscious bias. And you, you do do subtle, yeah. Yeah. nuanced things that uh, convey uh, things that you didn't intend to convey as a male co-worker. So I think that's... Just a perspective there. And unfortunately, right now, the, the larger proportion of the senior leaders in the organization are male. So at least educating them yeah. about these things hopefully will make them uh, take a different approach as they go into meetings or conversations with their yeah. <laughs> uh, women and male colleagues. So. Um, so which brings me to you know possibly the most uh, difficult question of all, and some of you have already touched on this a little bit, which is um, how do you get organizations to really uh, this happen, you know, sort of walk the talk, uh, go beyond lip service, and of course, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, there is a balance between diversity goals and making sure that uh, meritocracy is, uh, is definitely the, the key sort of measure for, uh, for growth. Um, and, you know, the, the, the scale of the problem is uh, fairly large. Another statistic that I read I thought was very interesting was that uh, in a, in a uh, blind interview, which is when uh, people were uh, given resumes without names, women were five times more likely to be shortlisted. And this included when the, the panelists were women as well. Right? So there's clearly a, a, a big problem uh, and uh, companies would like to do, uh, you know, all of them, I think, recognize that diversity is important, but do many companies have what it takes to push for, um, you know, to, to make sure that there are systems and processes in place and, uh, you know, sort of really walk the talk? It's not easy, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, usually the answer is, oh, let's ensure that we have a certain number of women and then uh, the quota system starts to fall in place and none of us like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when, uh, when I did my MBA just a, a year before I uh, joined my B school, they abolished the quota system and I'm like, thank God I have not entered this B school because there was a quota, quota system. system. I would have wondered why am I here? Of course, because of that, there was only 15 women actually that year, 12 women out of total 120. So yeah, so it shows that there is still something wrong with tests. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but, but I guess uh, it has to be more about how do we go, uh, instead of implementing quota system at the job level, can it be about number of resumes sourced? So if there is, if today we look at the representation of women in the workforce is 25%, we want to take it to 50 or 40, then can we ensure that when it comes to resumes that are being screened, at least 40% of the resumes are women. The rest of it is then on merit, right? So we have to think of such uh, indicators or metrics that work at a much lower level when it comes to organization selecting uh, the right candidate for the workforce. If that happens, then automatically over time, slowly, uh, the proportion of women will start to grow. But having said that, the challenge is not just getting them you know, to join the company. Uh, we have always found that at the lower levels, we have significantly higher percentages as compared to the higher levels. You know, as uh, women are growing up the, going up the ladder, a lot of them are just leaving the company or you know, changing work stream a lot of times as well. So I think the challenge lies there. One is acquisition, as we call in marketing, <laughs> customer acquisition. So here is acquisition of diverse talent, but then retention of the diverse talent is a bigger challenge. And we have to recognize that most of our policies that were designed, be it the working hours, be it you know how many days off you can take and how often you can work from home, were designed for a majority male workforce. And in the last 20 years, that has changed. And a lot of policies have changed. But by just changing the policy is not going to be enough. We have to now, if somebody has to travel from Sarjapur Road, where I live, to Embassy Manita, it is a one and a half hour hike. So now you're saying that, okay, uh, you can come late, but how late, right? I mean, it, it still means that I am on the road for three hours minimum, plus minimum eight hours, so work 11 hours. So what happens to my baby? So things like some organizations started having a daycare at work, that helps. Now you may say, oh, this is needed only for women. It's not true. In US, both parents take equal responsibility of the kids, and it is acceptable for a father to take a day off because the kid is sick. 
But in our culture, that is still not the case. Most of the time, it's the mother who ends up shouldering the responsibility. So if we have cultural differences like this from other uh, economies and countries, then we need to also have solutions which differ from other countries and economies. I think since we are in Bangalore and we are quote unquote the Silicon Valley of India and we have so many startups, I think that provides a wonderful opportunity for additional flexibility. And I think when you're working with smaller teams, uh, it's easier to frame those policies than if you're working with larger teams. But having said that, my old school manufacturing employer uh, had a work from home policy, which I thought was incredible. You know, literally could work from home four days a week. That is the first step. I think mindsets also have to change. You know, you're, if you have a boss who thinks that, hey, you know, she's not in her chair for eight hours, therefore she's not being productive, she's not contributing, then that's a problem. But I think companies can take the first step of framing those policies. And I think also uh, we need to be a little creative because it's not an easy problem to solve. I think all of us agree that it's, it's quite tough. So again, maybe a long-term, you know, slightly medium to long-term kind of goal, but uh, flexibility and ensuring that the metric for evaluation is really output and not number of hours in the seat. I'm not sure if I have much to add, but I think the framework that uh, we probably could follow and companies are following this is, uh, what are the points, again, going back to this retention question, right? So the main drop-off points happen at major life events, right? You have a, you got married, you have a baby, you have your second child, right? So, so uh, those are the points in which I think we should be even more supportive of uh, folks in that situation, both men and women, of course, but women, at least in the Indian community, take a larger portion of the uh, responsibility as my wife did when we had our first child. So uh, I think that's being thoughtful about those major points in life and how can the organization support needs to be very thoughtful. And of course, there is a, what happens on an ongoing basis, right? Uh, how do we help people uh, uh, see that, oh, this is doable. I think I, I'll go back to this notion of telling the stories and uh, giving the road models that will help people understand that uh, it's possible and it's not beyond <laughs> uh, the realm of possibilities. Those are. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd leave the last uh, couple of minutes for questions, uh, but I just wanted to quickly summarize. I think we've had uh, some really good insights. Um, you know, personally, uh, I think I've been lucky. I've worked in organizations uh, varying sizes, very small, very large, uh, in different locations. And I've always had, uh, I think, the luck to work with uh, women, in, you know, peer groups as well as leadership. And it's definitely been very enriching for me. Um, and I think all of us do agree that, you know, from a from a output perspective or a financial perspective, there is no doubt that diversity pays off, right? Um, but of course, uh, you, you know, uh, there are no easy solutions. But not doing anything is definitely not a solution. And so, you know, every step uh, that we take is going to matter. Um, and I also think that, you know, as women, uh, I think we also have a role to sort of uh, make sure that we are available to uh, to talk about it, to mentor people, to, you know, to send positive messaging, and then, uh, you know, as much male support as we can get uh, always helps. Uh, great. Thank you all very much. Uh, if there are questions, we'll be happy. The panelists will be happy to take them. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Pratik Agarwal. I'm from a talent development company, IB Professional School. Uh, very interesting topic, but you know, my observation is a little different and I had a question for you guys. Uh, so my observation in last 10 years training people, I've seen a lot of women doing the program, uh, maybe not from engineering, but from sciences, you know, statistics, economics, mathematics, a lot of them. So I just wanted to understand from the panelists here that uh, is it that you guys see that uh, uh, women are uh, not uh, there in the industry in data science? Or is it that it is in data engineering part of it that the women are less? So that's just wanted to understand uh, from your experience, any one of you. Uh, so there are women in analytics, the traditional analytics, and it is, but the ratio is still 26 to 30 percent, uh, whichever way you look at it. It is much lower when it comes to artificial intelligence, machine learning, the, the fields which require more engineering. And the fact remains that 
going forward, the traditional analytics is reducing, right? Nobody builds models in SaaS anymore because it used to take us two weeks to build a model and I cannot build 20 models in two hours. So there is no reason that I need somebody who's, you know, who knows statistics and a little bit of SaaS and can build models. So things, the need of the hour, and especially from where I come from, is a PhD in machine learning, is a PhD in math, you know, people who go deep in those areas, in those sciences. So that's where I'm realizing there is dearth of diverse talent. And when I'm in diverse talent, women is one way of looking at diverse talent. And that's, again, my personal experience. Okay. One last quick question, sorry. Um, is it because those uh, jobs that you're talking about, AI, machine learning, they require longer hours? I mean, because you know, a lot of engineers just don't go back home for like two or three days. So is it because of that? Is it that core reason? Actually, uh, our PhD in machine learning, he lives very far from the office. He comes to office only two days a week. So it is not about the number of hours. It's not about the flexibility. Uh, in fact, we are looking at hiring some of the talent in India. And even though our office is in Bangalore, we are saying, we don't care where you live. As long as you have the right skill set, you are available on phone, OK, reasonable US time you know, overlap with Eastern time zone, we don't care which city of India you are from. So we, I think the dearth of the talent is so much, you know, gender being aside, in general, good talent in this space is so limited uh, that these rules of how many hours you need to work in a day that you have to be in office, have, they have all gone out of the window. All we care is can you deliver on this in this specified time frame, which we believe is the acceptable time frame. Good, thank you. So I think the point raised about tests being not appropriate, no, I, I actually agree with that. It's not just even about uh, not capturing the gender diversity, it's even about capturing the right talent. So tests are not at all designed to capture the right talent. You're not asking questions which are designed to solve real world problems. The other thing which is, unless you are going to design entirely new kind of AI, which very few people are doing, let's say working on some aspects of meta learning, most cases, right now with the technology is soon going to reach a drag and drop state. So there it's about creativity and we are not testing anyone on creativity. So, and I do think when I talk of, I mean, I'm, now it's kind of fashionable to call a uh, feminist. I've been calling myself that for 15 years and meaning that. But uh, what is uh, one of the things that I have uh, realized that we tend to even brush under the carpet the diversity, it's actually Innately, biologically, I would even say women are superior to men in certain ways, while men may have certain abilities which are better. I'll give you even biological examples. And it's talking of average, it's not talking of individuals. Uh, if it is about landmark navigation, which can even apply to good algorithms, women are innately better. Now, there might be some men which are better. If it's about directionality, men are better, independent of landmarks. So we know from neuroscience, there are certain differences, even in our networking abilities. So capturing mental diversity, I'm not even approaching it from gender perspective, mm -hmm. capturing mental diversity, diversity of thinking is very important. And I don't, not just even India, India is a different ball game altogether. Uh, whether it's UT Austin or the time I spent at NYU or Cold Spring Harbor in New York, I didn't see any active effort to genuinely capture those problem solving abilities and capture them from different diverse thinking backgrounds. So I think tests need to be entirely sort of, you know, reinvented. We need more of you talking to our engineering colleges. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks to the audience. Thanks.